Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing for Alberta on September 17th, 2021. We are live streaming from the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples. We are grateful to live and work in Alberta, a province on the traditional territory of 48 different First Nations and the unceded homeland of the Métis Nation. Today's conversation is being shared in ASL. To ensure access to completely accurate information, closed captioning will be uploaded after the live stream is complete. This conversation for the public is being shared live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. We are hopeful that this will increase the accessibility of our briefings for all Albertans. The Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing is a regular panel of doctors and experts. We will endeavor to bring timely, accurate updates on the COVID-19 crisis in Alberta and take questions from the media. The views of our panelists are their own and do not represent any institutions they may be affiliated with. We have collectively gathered here as concerned Albertans attempting to ensure that everyone in the province has access to as much information concerning COVID-19 in Alberta as possible. Today we are going to divert from our standard format to look at three very important topics impacting Albertans. We always endeavor to hear the current concerns of Albertans and respond as best we can. Today's briefing will not just have one main focal point. It will explore three interconnected but distinct areas we are hearing you would like prioritized. Triage, transportation of patients both within and beyond our health zones, and surgical cancellations. We value providing reliable information, and we will arrange a more in-depth panel on these topics in the future if Albertans feel it is needed. We will begin today with some presentations and discussions on triage and transport, after which we will look at surgical cancellations and hear from a surgeon and a couple of patients around the realities facing Albertans in need of surgical interventions. Thank you everyone for joining us. I would like to bring Dr. Schwartz into the conversation to start things off with an update on COVID-19 in Alberta. Dr. Schwartz. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Michelle. So um, we're not gonna delve too much into today's numbers because we haven't had the, the opportunity to incorporate them just yet as they were just released. Um, but I'm gonna, um, well, uh, first start by acknowledging that unfortunately we lost another 18 Albertans uh, over the last 24 hours. And, um, you know, this is really an unacceptable number at this stage in the pandemic, given that this was all um, avoidable. So um, my condolences to their families. Um, what we're focusing today on is going to be ICU capacity, which is intricately uh, intertwined with deaths. And so, um, over the last 24 hours, we did not see an increase in the number of deaths. In fact, we saw a net drop, sorry, in, um, in ICU admissions. We saw a net drop in ICU admissions, but we saw a net increase in deaths. And we don't know the stories here, uh, but often what will happen is um, as patients are, are not considered to be eligible for upgrade or escalation of care to the ICU, um, they are uh, palliated, meaning they're uh, their goals of care are shifted to uh, keep them comfortable to control their symptoms uh, and ultimately um, to, to try to address those things that are addressed without focusing uh, on trying to uh, keep them alive artificially using breathing machines like ventilators or uh, more invasive um, measures. So I just have a few slides just to sort of outline what the issues are here. Thank you, Michelle. So, uh, so this is a slide courtesy of uh, Ziad Fazel, um, a member of our group, and you can check out um, his his excellent work on uh, Twitter. His his feed is there, and uh, this hasn't been updated today. And so, in fact, today, as I said, the ICU numbers have come down a tiny bit. Um, but as you can see, there's you know been this clear um, exponential increase in the number of patients in ICU beds. And the, uh, the, the orange line is the baseline ICU capacity, uh, which is 173. So this is 173 fully staffed ICU beds, meaning they're staffed by a trained, an ICU trained nurse, an ICU trained physician, a respiratory therapist, etc. cetera. Um, once we get above that line, then we're going into surge capacity. And the maximum surge capacity is, is 
you can see it's creeping up there. It's the yellow line. And so it's a, to some degree a shifting target, but right now it's maxed out at 312. And you can see that we're really uh, flirting with that yellow line much closer than we would like. Um, it, according to, to this projection, it'll be less than a week before we are uh, really um, exceeding that, that line. And, and of course that is, uh, is catastrophic. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just to give you an idea of how grim this is, um, I, I certainly couldn't say it better than uh, Dr. Ron Breesbo, who has um, very, very uh, different uh, lived experiences. So uh, what he, he said in a CBC article today is that he's been to war 10 times in his career, five times in Afghanistan, and he's never been as exasperated as he is right now in uh, a major tertiary care Canadian hospital. He works at the University of Alberta Hospital as an ICU physician. Uh, next slide, please. Or next slide, please. So this was a tweet yesterday from Alberta Health Services, and this was really, um, really jarring for me. Uh, not to see this scene, uh, because we've been seeing this in other stages of the pandemic, other waves, but to have AHS um, tweet this out really was remarkable. And it really is to me a uh, an SOS that they're send sending out. It's a cry for help. Uh, they, you know, have have uh, let down the, the the facade, and they truly want everybody, all Albertans, to see how dire the situation is, uh, so that hopefully we can help them out by changing our behavior and getting vac vaccinated. So what we're seeing here is two patients in an ICU room. So ICU rooms are designed for one patient each. Um, they are uh, typically looked after by one uh, nurse dedicated to that one patient. And so when we talk about surge capacity, this is how surge beds are created. Extra beds are, are uh, smushed in with the, with the first, or sometimes the ICU is, uh, spills over onto other wards and, and other uh, sites of the hospital are converted into ICUs, uh, which has its own set of challenges. So if you look closely, so both of these patients are prone, we call this adult tummy, adult tummy time. Um, basically patients, when they're on their tummies, they have better oxygenation, better oxygen uh, exchange across their lungs. And so uh, this is something that's frequently done. But as um, Nurse Ellie uh, pointed out on, on Monday, this is really an intensive um, uh, uh, exercise to, to flip people over. They've got a breathing tube down um, in their airways. They have, you know, usually uh, four or five or more uh, IV cannulas that are hooked up to different machines. And so it really isn't something that you can just, you know, flip a patient over. This is something that requires very skilled uh, individuals working as a team to carefully uh, turn the patient over and secure all of those airways, all those cannula, uh, to make sure that they don't get yanked out. Now, just look at the amount of space that is between these beds and around these beds. And uh, if you can just go to the next slide, please. So this was a comment from a colleague of mine um, in the States, good luck running a code in that room. And so um, next slide, please. So this is a, a picture of a code. Both of these photos, I should point out, are by Heather uh, Patterson, who's an emergency doctor, who has um, taken, uh, taken a sabbatical year to photograph um, and, uh, and capture uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, so she's uh, gotten these really amazing uh, intimate photos uh, that have been released in um, in conjunction with AHS. So this is an example of a code. I don't know the specifics of this patient, but you can look at the number of individuals that are involved. Uh, you know, in this case, I, I count uh, nine individuals. Um, and, you know, it really is something that you need different people switching off doing chest compressions. You have a respiratory therapist at the head of the bed. You have um, different nurses that are placing IV cannula or that are, um, that are pushing IV medications. Um, you have another uh, ID physician who, oh, sorry, another uh, physician or uh, other team leader who is um, directing the code. You have somebody else who's who's recording things. So this really is a, a, a team uh, affair. And if you just go to the next slide, please. 
So just a reminder of the space that we're dealing with. Um, this is, you know, obviously not optimally set up for that sort of scenario. And so when I talk about, you know, that these uh, surge beds are not set up to provide the same standard of care that Albertans deserve and that we are uh, accustomed to, this is what I mean. This is just one example. And um, to be fair, Dr. Verna Yu has, has stressed, you know, these are not normal ICU beds. And so this is a glimpse uh, a rare glimpse that AHS has provided into exactly what we're talking about. So how do we deal with, with this when we uh, are getting right up to that uh, surge bed capacity? Uh, there's three major ways that have been identified. The first is uh, to um, decrease the influx of, um, of patients that are coming in after surgical procedures. Uh, really complicated surgeries require a stay in the OR. Uh, uh, so those patients now are not going there because the surgeries have been canceled. In addition, this frees up uh, staffing and space um, from the canceled OR. So the OR uh, nurses, the anesthesiologists might be redeployed to the, the emergency, uh, sorry, the ICU. Um, and in addition, those uh, uh, OR rooms might be converted into makeshift ICUs. The second is uh, that has been highlighted as a potential strategy by uh, Alberta Health is to transport patients out of province. Now we know Idaho is getting slammed with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so is Montana and the Idaho, pa Idaho patients are spilling over into Montana. So we really aren't gonna get a lot of assistance from our neighbors to the South. BC has already said they're not gonna be able to accept us. Um, Saskatchewan is in a similar situation to us and said they can't uh, take any uh, patients. We know that Manitoba is 20, pa 50 patients already over the ICU census, meaning they're already past, um, they're into surge capacity as well. So they're not going to be taking any, any uh, ICU patients. So we're looking at Ontario or further. And so uh, Dr. Buchanan is going to talk about some of those challenges of, you know, what does that mean logistically to transport a patient that's critically ill, very, very unstable, uh, all the way to Ontario or, or further. Uh, and then the third option is that we have to limit which patients get access to the ICU. And so this is the, the um, infamous triage protocol, which um, Dr. Bakshi is going to dive into in discussion with Dr. Buchanan. So with no further ado, I just wanted to set up the conversation today, uh, give a little insight in exactly what we're talking about. And I'm gonna uh, hand it off to my uh, esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, thanks, Dr. Schwartz. So uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the critical care protocol. And uh, before I get into the triage protocol, before I get into that, um, it is publicly available on the Alberta Health website for those that are interested in looking at it. Um, there is an executive summary as well that provides a little bit of the background on how the protocol was developed. And I wanted to also highlight that this critical care triage protocol was not developed specifically for this pandemic. It is a protocol that's been developed by Alberta Health Services for any instance in which we have critical care capacity concerns, issues, and we have to go into this protocol. So that's a very important point to know that this was not created specifically for COVID-19, although it was uh, created during a time where we felt we may require it for this pandemic. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge how morally distressing and devastating it is to even bring up the idea of critical care triage and daily discussion. Uh, as healthcare providers, we are faced with difficult decisions all the time, but rarely, if ever, are these decisions thrust upon us due to external factors such as resources, um, uh, as we are seeing in this pandemic. As an Albertan, I know how scary it is to hear that this, there may not be space for you, for your loved ones, your children, especially if we need to enact this triage protocol. So first and foremost, I want to reassure Albertans and healthcare workers that AHS operations physicians are doing everything humanly possible to avoid uh, this triage by increasing personnel, supplies, space. That means that we have changing ICU footprints in hospital spaces, just as Dr. Schwartz mentioned, finding non-traditional spaces to place ICU beds, uh, it means calling on uh, physicians and nurses from other areas of healthcare and other provinces to assist with staffing. It means calling on our provincial neighbors to accept patients in the ICU, which Dr. Buchanan will speak to uh, a little bit later. The behind the scenes work that is going on is a minute to minute, hour to hour basis, and it is incredible. 
And I assure you that this is currently an all hands on deck scenario uh, to be able to provide, to be able to avoid this pr protocol from ever having to be utilized. All of that being said, we understand that uh, this protocol is now in, in the public space and that we are talking about it. And in full transparency, it is being discussed in physician groups as well. We all need to understand this protocol so that in the event that we do need to utilize it, we are well prepared and we are able to make decisions in a rational manner if possible. Again, not invalidating the moral stress around this, but in a high stress situation, we want to make sure that we are prepared. I'm also gonna quickly talk about some of the concerns and questions that I've been seeing around social media uh, and that I've been hearing with conversations with colleagues and other Albertans. The critical care triage protocol provides a framework that gives physician an unbiased, comprehensive workflow to follow. It was created over a two year period with a wide range of experts, nurses, physicians, ethicists, legal, uh, based on evidence-based data from worldwide jurisdictions, clinical scoring mechanisms that have been used in, in, in the intensive care units for many years. Within this protocol, there are multiple levels and layers of checks and balances, and these are in place to ensure that no physician is tasked with making these decisions on the fly in a high stress situation. There are triage protocol teams that are going to be developed, and there will be point of care triage teams that you will see uh, in the hospital and the rural settings, uh, no matter where the patient may be. All of the education and training required to understand this protocol is starting to happen. We're making sure that everybody is understanding of what this protocol looks like. But as I said, we are doing everything humanly possible to avoid having to ever enact this protocol. One of the big questions or concerns that I've been seeing, and many of you may be thinking this or hearing this, is did we take vaccination status into account when creating this protocol? And it's my hope that at some point in the next couple of days or weeks, we can have a, a broader ethical discussion about this with some clinical ethicists on, on this channel. But I wanted to quickly talk about why we have not put vaccines or vaccination statuses in the tri triage protocol. Number one in general, as any physician or healthcare provider knows, we treat the patient that's in front of us, regardless of what uh, their choices have been in their life and what is going on. We treat the patient in front of us. Whatever clinical scenario they're going through, that is what we treat. It is also very dangerous to make assumptions about patients who uh, may not be vaccinated. We don't know why they're not vaccinated. We don't know if it's lack of access to the vaccination, if it's multiple barriers to facilitate getting the vaccine. Uh, is it an anti-vaxxer? We don't know at the, at the moment that we're seeing these patients. And at the moment that we're seeing these patients, we are simply there to help them try to recover through whatever they're going through. Uh, nobody benefits when a physician is making a snap moral judgment about a patient, and that is it, true for any scenario that we're dealing with. So to, to answer that piece of concern that may be coming up, uh, there's no plan to put vaccination status into the triage protocol. The protocol is a very objective tool that allows physicians to enter phys uh, patient information into there based on what um, uh, various conditions they may have and allows for an objective decision to be made. That does not underscore the moral distress that all of us will be facing if this is enacted. From the ICU physicians who have to use this protocol to make the decision if they can accept patients into the ICU, to the medicine ward physicians who will be uh, seeing and caring for these patients who are not uh, able to be put into the ICU, to the family members who are going to be receiving the news that uh, their loved one um, has been uh, uh, deemed not able to take ICU care, and to everybody that may be affected in the hospital that is involved in this process. So um, we certainly are, are very, very hopeful that we do not have to get to this protocol, uh, but I want to assure our Bortons that uh, we, all the physicians and everybody that may be involved in this is doing what they can to prevent that and also learning how this may work in case we need to do it. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Buchanan. Yeah, so... You know, I think, you know, um, just for Dr. Bakshi, do you want me to talk about uh, transport or talk a little bit more about triage? Either which one that you're feeling, Dr. Buchanan, if there's anything that you okay. would like to add to the triage conversation, please feel free to. Um, but I, we have been yeah. receiving a lot of questions around what it looks like to transfer patients both within sure. our health zones and beyond our health zones and the sustainability yeah. of that and how that 
even mechanically can work given the distances yes. that we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I think Dr. Bashi answered the the the, the uh, pandemic triage protocols uh, and concerns well. So I'll I'll go on to transport. So um, I do critical care uh, at the University of Alberta Hospital ICU when I work for Stars or Ambulance, and uh, I deal a lot with everything from um, from helicopters to planes to ground. Um, and I deal a lot with uh, transportation of the critically ill. Now, in, in, in conventional times, um, prior to this, transport was all about getting people around Alberta. Um, Alberta, of course, is pretty geographically uh, separated. So we have people flying from the north, from the east, from the west, to the south, to major uh, tertiary care hospitals like in Edmonton and Calgary. Um, but now we're kind of talking about flying people uh, from Alberta to other provinces. Now, I just want to kind of walk you through the journey of what this looks like. So I think the first question that comes to my mind is who do you select? Um, and, and that, you know, that has, um, that's a very difficult area to, to talk about because, um, you know, for example, if I took somebody who was freshly made from the emergency department with COVID related respiratory failure, they can have very uh, drastic and dramatic fluctuations in their oxygen requirements. And they can have quite unpredictable um, uh, courses and changes of, of how um, they respond to therapy. In some cases, I can have somebody who's on, you know, a few liters of oxygen by nasal prongs. And within six hours, they're on basically max amount of oxygen that we can possibly provide before we actually put them on a, a form of life support called uh, mechanical ventilation. So, you know, uh, it's certainly hard to transport people with these uh, considerations, but also there's really no family that, that wants their loved one to be to be separated from geographically. And so that's also um, it's very hard on it's hard on families, it's hard on patients. It's hard on healthcare providers to make these decisions. Um, so, you know, we're kind of left with this idea of, you know, how, how do we pick? And, you know, there's been issues before that have been highlighted in Manitoba around selection of patients and how do you do that? So, you, so again, you ensure a degree of equality and, and opportunity, but also make sure that you respect um, patients and families' wishes as much as possible. But in this situation, we really are trying to maximize the resources locally um, and externally. So, once a person is picked, you know, that's kind of when the, is, or I should say, selected to be transported, the question of destination comes up next. Of course, the longer you travel, the, the more potentially difficult it is, okay? And that may require stops or refueling uh, and such. Uh, hopefully not, hopefully it'd be a one trip destination, but it's possible it could be a stop for refueling. But that also requires ground transport. Of course, we don't transport from, from the hospital to a plane. We transport from a hospital to a ground ambulance, to a plane. And then on the plane, um, they are there. And then of course, they get transported off the plane and carted over by ground to another hospital. And so each time the patient gets transferred, there is, there is a particular uh, challenge. So going from, you know, going from a hospital to the ambulance, for example, there's always potential for risk there, um, especially if someone is, is unstable or becomes unstable in transport. Those are all concerns that get highlighted whenever there's a shift of care going from, say, from the hospital to the to the emergency medical services workers or from EMS to the. Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for bearing with us while we experience some technical challenges. Before we dropped out, Dr. Buchanan was talking about the transpo process and what that is like for patients who are having to leave our jurisdiction. Dr. Buchanan, I bring it back to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I, um, you know, I, I suppose one of the best ways to kind of conceptualize how transport of a critically ill patient looks, I guess if you compare it to say like an egg race where you're carrying an egg with a, on, on a spoon, right? And you're carrying that and you don't want to drop it because you'll break the egg. But then, but then you have to pass that egg off to someone else and they have to run as well as a relay. And that's very much like the handoff in a, in a critical care transport. There are many potential problems that can happen, whether it's monitoring devices, uh, breathing machines, for example, and you know our our um, members of our experts, including uh, you know ambulance staff, EMS staff, and and air medical crew, they are very attuned to these problems. But you know they can be very difficult to detect, especially when you're say flying in the air at twenty five thousand feet. So that's certainly one big concern. Now I just want to mention too that in the ICU, in the luxury of being in a place that's that's somewhat static. Um, we do a lot of this proning uh, thing where basically we take someone who's on their back and, you know, if they're, if they can do it themselves, we ask them to lay on their chest. 
But oftentimes, if they're on a ventilator, we ask we actually have to get a, a very um, large number of staff, up to six to seven nurses, respiratory therapists, and physicians to help actually take the patient, put them on their side, and put them on their chest in a way that's comfortable and, and doesn't and doesn't give the patient any injury. And this is a very effective maneuver. However, this maneuver cannot be done in transport. Um, and it's, it's, it's perilous, it's dangerous to transport, so it's not done um, because simply, you know, it would be untenable level of risk. Um, so we just can't do that. And, and so we're kind of left to make sure we pick the patients that will best survive transport. And that is actually quite challenging. You know, we have patients who are on a ventilator for six days with COVID, and it might look like, they're, like their oxygen requirements are even keel. But we can certainly see very sudden changes. And that can be because the disease itself, because COVID is worse in the lungs. That can be because they developed a blood clot in their lungs, because they developed a secondary infection. So, and these things can happen um, in, in COVID, in coronavirus, they're, they're predictable, like on a, on a global stat scale. But on the individual patient level, they, are, they can be less predictable. And so those things are kind of hard to mitigate in terms of transporting a patient. And those are the concerns that we always want to make sure that we are addressing prior to sending anybody out. One final question or first question, final question for this moment before we go back into questions for you, Dr. Buchanan. You talked a lot about the flight team, the paramedics, flight physicians, um, folks who are up in the air and on the ground doing this transporting. How many of those folks do we have in Alberta? What type of resource does that in of itself? And so I guess, how many patients would it even be possible to transport if there was room in other jurisdictions? Well, you know, I think this is the question that that I, um, frankly, am, am worried about. I mean, I, you know, I routinely do a call with a number of different colleagues um, for for STARS, and we see that the resources right now are stretched. And and that includes resources like helicopters, planes, and ground ambulances. And really, we're talking about fixed wing or, or airplanes here. Now, um, I'm not exactly sure of the number of personnel staff we have for a medical crew within Alberta, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if the pool was around uh, was around you know 100 to 200, for example. Um, but of course, um, you know, we have a high amount of need in Alberta because we ship people throughout this province in all directions because of the geographic nature of, of our province. And so I think our current resource demands are really high and we, we already have issues with ground supports. So I think uh, my suspicion is what we'd be looking at is recruiting other resources from say Ontario, if that's where they'd be shipped to. So perhaps we'd have to task a resource out of Ontario to come help a patient uh, out of Alberta to bring them back. And, and then again, I have to you know really um, have some concern that they may also have issues that are impending um, with resource countries crunches. So, you know, these kinds of um, these kinds of tools of caring for critically critically ill and transporting them are certainly, um, you know, highly specialized in, in a pretty um, highly used commodity. So I'm I'm not sure how that would look. I mean, I there's certainly been uh, other places in the world in prior waves where they move people in bulk with with big planes and trains and such. So, you know, I think um, in some places I would. You know, I wonder if they were being involved into the military, for example, to use large capacity for larger for larger transportation of critically ill. Because, you know, having one person in one plane, that ties up a resource for somewhere in Canada. Um, and I, I just don't know. I don't know how feasible that is right now. And it's it's just there's a lot of things in the air. Um, I, I suppose that's a really bad uh, comparison. There's a lot of uh, calculations, I should say, that people are leery of. And I, I don't know how that looks at this point in time, given high demands across all provinces. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite Dr. Shudnate into the conversation um, to look at the third component of today's conversation. Um, we know that our healthcare system is in a massive amount of transition in order to make the necessary accommodations so that we can avoid implementing triage protocols and ideally save as many Albertans as possible. You're joining us from a general and breast surgery background. Could you give us a bit of an overview as to what it has been like for you as surgeries have been canceled 
and you've had to shift, I suspect, some of your work. Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously this has been a, an increasingly challenging area for all of the surgeons in the province from cardiac to vascular to thoracics to general surgery. Um, and, you know, we're having to shift our focus um, away from providing um, the care that we're used to, to providing the care that we would expect patients to benefit the most from uh, with very, very limited resources. Um and, you know, in order to kind of understand where we're at with this, I wanted to just spend a few minutes briefly talking about how we manage wait lists in Alberta. Um, next slide, please. So um, in Alberta, we have this thing called uh, uh, adult coding access targets for surgery that I'll talk about. And that really helps us to manage our wait lists. Um, and then I'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about um, what we're doing about sh um, scheduling or uh, postponement. Uh, of, of scheduled surgery and how that's affecting things right now. Um, and also um, my thoughts about uh, potentially where we're going to end up uh, with this in the future, which I think is going to be uh, the real challenge is how we're going to get caught up with this. So next slide, please. So um, in Alberta, we're really fortunate that we've been working on wait lists, um, um, trying to figure out, you know, uh, how, how patients are waiting for surgery. And we've been doing this for a number of years. Um, so every patient that's scheduled for surgery in Alberta is given a, a code. It's a four-digit code. And with that code, um, there's a, a, a amount of time that's expected that that patient is expected to be in the operating room and cared for. So, for example, if I see a lady with breast cancer, um, they're given a code FUF7. And everybody that's um, in the scheduling process knows that that patient needs to be seen um, in the operating room and operated on within a month of me seeing them and deciding that they need surgery. Um, so there's the important date of when I've seen them, um, the important date of when they must have the surgery by. And then also within that is sometimes we have to delay surgery for chemotherapy or for staging workups and things like that. So um, they're ready to treatment. The, the date that they're ready to be treated may actually be a little bit later down the road. So we have a very robust data set of, of information about each patient that's waiting for surgery in Alberta. Um, and it allows us to manage our wait list. For example, if I have a large number of breast cancer patients that I'm not able to get into the operating room in time, then I'm going to be asking my other breast cancer colleagues um, in the city to help me look after some of them. Or perhaps I'll we'll shift some of the consults away from me to um, some of my colleagues. Now, the important thing to understand is that this does not allow us to determine how long it takes to get in to see a specialist uh, with a diagnosis. Um, and that information is equally as important, but yet uh, we're still working on um, how to ways to figure out how, how that um, how that is and also what, um, you know, how the uh, pandemic is is having an impact on that. So next slide, please. So the way things are as of uh, about an hour ago when I last called the Grey Nuns Hospital, um, and it's really important for, for everybody in the audience and all Albertans to understand that this is a, a rapidly evolving um, situation. And, and as it stands right now, we, are, um, we have a whole team of nurses and physicians and surgeons and anesthetists that are looking at this and doing everything we can to make sure that uh, minimal harm comes to you while you're waiting for surgery. Um, so it's important to know that emergency surgery continues. So if you have appendicitis or cholecystitis or you have a, a, a brain bleed or, or some cardiac event or something, you will still be cared for. And so we don't want people waiting at home um, with symptoms um, and sort of triaging themselves, so to speak. Um, we want you to go get the care that you need. So one of the things that we've seen in previous waves that, that has been challenging is patients sitting at home with symptoms that if they had presented to hospital earlier, we would have been able to intervene earlier and perhaps got them home sooner and, and therefore um, consuming extra resources. So, so please, um, if you have concerning symptoms, um, contact 911 or 811 or talk to your physician or come to the emergency department um, and, and don't delay the care that you need because it will help. Um, so emergency surgery will continue and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that that continues um, at all costs. Now, as we've seen more of our nursing staff, our anesthetists, our respiratory therapists be um, redeployed out of the operating room into the intensive care units and some of the uh, extra capacity places that we've, we've mobilized, um, we, our ability to provide surgical care has, has shrunk. So we are now... Um, at a much reduced capacity in terms of number of OR theaters that we're able to staff and provide. And for that reason, we're having to figure out what patients will benefit 
the most from surgery and trying to hopefully um, prevent uh, people being harmed from having to wait for it, uh, wait for their operation. So as it stands, as of right now, today, we are still able, doing li uh, able to do life and limb saving surgery um, or a delay of more than two weeks would adversely affect income. So things like uh, life-threatening vascular problems and cardiac problems and, and things like that. So um, we are still pe people with ha that have the ACATS code uh, where the it's life and limb less than two weeks. We're still getting those done. Um, cancer surgery where any delay will affect prognosis. Those will be prioritized as well. And, and or a delay of up to four weeks is not expected to affect prognosis. So if you have breast cancer, we will still... Uh, endeavor to, to make sure that that you have uh, have the care that you need colon cancer things like that um, unfortunately uh, as this uh, situation evolves the lists are growing of people that need surgery uh, and we still have a finite resource so um, we have teams of nurses of physicians that are uh, that are triaging the people on the waiting list and trying to figure out who needs to go first uh, from the top to the bottom which is obviously a monumental task extraordinarily stressful for everybody that's doing it um, and and I really give kudos to the nursing uh, management teams and physicians that are that are doing this work because um, it's it's extremely stressful work um, so we are um, we are trying to get that that up and running can you bring the slide back up for me please I lost the I lost the slideshow it will reappear momentarily okay Um, so there we go. Oh, yes. The, the final thing, uh, two things I wanted to talk about is that, um, one of the things that is always complicated when there's a lack of inpatient bed space is there are a number of these cases that require inpatient beds. And so we need to really kind of manage, um, the patients waiting for surgery, um, that require admission. So we can't have 10 cases in one day where, where the, we expect them to, uh, you know, for example, need a hospital bed after surgery. So that adds to the complexity of the decision making. So, you know, day surgeries are, are, are easy to deal with, but if you need to be admitted, it makes it, makes it much more complicated. And the final thing is, is that uh, Alberta Health um, is committed to making um, the, the process across the province equitable for all Albertans. So um, your chance of getting surgery um, will be the same no matter where you live in the province and, and how that rolls out will be will be ultimately a, a, a one of the bigger challenges but we want to make sure that everybody understands that that you will get your surgery uh, with the same likelihood whether you live in Calgary, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat or, or Edmonton um, for that matter. Um, so uh, my final thoughts about uh, this is where we're at right now and obviously this is a, a an evolving situation um you know by monday we may not have we may have all of our OR theaters filled with ventilated covid patients and not be able to do any uh more scheduled surgery um you know it's so we're we're constantly reevaluating things we're trying to figure out where things are going um and, and trying to, to uh, figure out the best um methods to look after things my biggest concern about where this is headed, though, is that we are seeing a bigger and bigger load, backload of patients that are waiting for surgery. And at some point, we're going to need to figure out ways to look after these patients. Um, and the, the issue will be we have an already uh, exhausted and depleted, of work, depleted workforce. And as this uh, pandemic rages, um, I, there, it may be possible that surgeons uh, will get ill as well. Um, I, I'm myself, I'm six months away from my last shot. So will I get COVID um, myself and get ill? So these are these are all concerning things about about today, but also in the future is, is how are we going to get um, enough staff back healthy um, to be able to do the massive extra work that's going to be necessary, not only to look after people that, that are waiting today, but also have been waiting for surgery um, that haven't been able to get in. Um, and, and that's going to be uh, the, the major undertaking that this government is going to need to figure out um, in, the, in the very near future. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, we've talked a lot about some really big, heavy, dense um, happenings in our province during this conversation today. And before I bring the rest of our medical team in for some questions, we're going to take a moment and talk with a couple of patients who have been dramatically affected 
by what is happening in our healthcare system. I would like to introduce you all to both Rachel and Eric, both of whom have had delays on procedures um, over the last week as things have really started to get into that critical state. Um, thank you both very much for taking the time to be here today. Um, I'm a person who really likes people, and so it means a lot to me to get to hear from both of you and how this experience has been impacting you guys. Um, maybe if it's okay with the two of you, we'll start with Rachel. And Rachel, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your story, and then we'll move into Eric's story. For sure. Happy to share a little bit about it. Um, so my background is actually, uh, uh, for about 14 years, I was lucky enough to care for a young man who was uh, medically complex, but unfortunately passed away uh, last, or this past, or last year, um, last August. So we just um, passed the first year mark as a, as a bereaved parent. And uh, right around the same time, I actually got diagnosed uh, because one of the things caregivers have a real tendency to do is to ignore their own healthcare um, because they're so hyper-focused on their kids. And so I thought, dang it, it's kind of time for me to actually go start taking care of myself. So I went in for a checkup and they asked me whether or not I wanted to start because I, I'm 41, whether or not it'd be worth talking about um, getting a mammogram. And I thought, well, why not? I, I have a few uh, complexities from adolescence and I thought it's probably good to kind of do my due diligence and went in and they ended up finding a bunch of calcifications which in some respects didn't surprise me, but at the same time, it kind of felt like a slap in the face from the universe. I uh, spent about seven years um, doing serious palliative care for my son. And I was kind of at a point, you know, a year later, like I, I just wanted an opportunity to go live my life. Um, I, I did great by him. And I know now, now is the time to do great by me. And, uh, so when it came to having to wait for the surgery, it was just, it kind of brought back a lot of grief. Um, I, I don't blame doctors. I don't blame physicians. I don't blame hospitals. Um, I've had a permanent relationship with healthcare for my entire parenting career. Um, planning on joining the team of all things with all the stress of COVID. Um, the fact that I very much want to jump into and um, things like medical school down the road is uh, speak uh, highly to how I feel about everybody um, who is caring for patients right now. Um, but yeah, to, to have to wait um, was a, just a real hard thing to deal with, just given my prior experiences and uh, to have to sit and uh, kind of figure out whether or not it is breast cancer um, and what next steps are and kind of figuring out whether or not it's going to be me being sick for the next little while or whether I can plan for a future. Um, so that's kind of the short version of my story. Oh, you're on mute. It's because I am projecting that I am not in the digital universe and that we could be sharing this space in a, in a non-digital fashion. Um, Rachel, thank you. Um, we've had the opportunity with the POP AB briefings to talk so much with wonderful experts, but have not had the same opportunity to talk about individual Albertans lived experiences from the other side of that, from the patient side. And I, I am just so thankful that you offered your strength and your story for everyone at home today. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'm going to bring Eric back into our window and then I am going to bring you back into our window again shortly, Rachel. 
Hi, Eric. Hello. Thank you very much um, for being with us today. Some folks watching might have heard a little bit or a lot about your story. Um, I will, if it is okay with you, allow you to recap what the last week in particular, but more so the last while has been like for you. Um, yeah, as opposed to me attempting that. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll presume not everyone has heard my story. So I'll start with back in end of June this year, um, I had what I learned to was a seizure. Um, I went to the Strathcona County Hospital here. I got a CT scan done and they told me I had a brain tumor. Um, I was uh, I was moved to the University Hospital here in Edmonton, had an MRI and they confirmed that I had a tumor. They uh, kept me overnight and uh, met with a neurosurgeon the uh, next day. He told me that um, that he wasn't going to do surgery right away, that my case would go to the tumor review board and then uh, uh, they'll get back to me on uh, what the next steps would be. In the beginning of August, I had a visit to the Cross Cancer Institute. They've informed me that surgery is the best course of action, and especially because they, uh, they need tissue to determine what sort of radiation or chemotherapy treatments they can start me on. Um, certain brain cancers of different brain cells uh, react better to some treatments than others, so they need that info. So uh, um, I originally had a surgery scheduled for, um, I can't remember the date, it was uh, about a week ago now, uh, Wednesday, um, less than uh, 24 hours before, I got a call saying that uh, my surgery has been canceled and they didn't have a follow-up date at that time. Um, obviously that uh, put me in a lot of stress. Um, yes, I saw my, yeah, go ahead. You can put that up there. But that, that's uh, my tumor is, it's uh, between the right frontal and temporal lobes. Um, the imaging is flipped. Um, but uh, it's a, I've been told it's about the size of a tangerine or mandarin orange. And um, so far it's affected things like um, I've been having trouble coming up with words. Um, my, uh, my coordination is off. Um, um, and some other things. Um, the day I was supposed to have a surgery, I spoke a lot with uh, some uh, some of the news outlets here in Edmonton, and I imagine some people saw me on the television. Um, that that evening, um, I had the worst seizure I've ever had. Um, it's the first one where I've convulsed. Um, I convulsed for about a minute, then. Uh, the aura and everything else um, didn't uh, disappear till about five minutes. I was rushed to the university hospital. Unfortunately, because of the ongoing situation, um, it took me a number of hours before I could even get a emergency room bed. Um, again, they were very busy. Their, their waiting room was overflowing into the yeah, stallery area. So. Uh, thankfully, when I was there, heard that uh, they had picked a new date for my surgery, which is next week, Wednesday. Um, of course, when we hear about these uh, upcoming possible surgery um, cancellations, it's hard. Um, 
Thank you, Eric. And you know, um, since, just one more thing, since the uh, ideally, um, my neuro neurosurgeon informed me that ideally I would have been admitted and they could possibly squeeze me in earlier, but there was no room in neurology at the time. So. I really, really, really hope that next Wednesday is the day that you will get to safely move to the universe of tumor freeism. Thank you. <laughs> or at least, at least at the start, because yeah. they, can't, they can't surgically remove it all. So, <laughs> at least um, some some more answers for you in terms of knowing what those next steps are going to look like. Myself as a human knows that I personally do best when there is a path and a plan and something that I can at least put my feet in front of each other towards. And I can't imagine how September 7th must have felt when you got the phone call about September 8th and how this last week has been. That unshakiness of a path is always one of the hardest to, to swallow. Yeah, when I got the phone call, I was probably shaking, physically shaking for the hour following. It was hard. It was very hard. I'm going to bring all of us back into this conversation as we approach just after five, but we lost some time to technical difficulties. Before we say goodbye for the weekend, and given how much we have attempted to cover today to answer as many questions as we can for folks before things, before we don't appear for the weekend. Um, what is everyone thinking right now, I guess? What would everyone like to leave Albertans with as we move into some truly unprecedented and different times? Can I go first? <laughs> Please. Um, as a surgeon, I'm, I'm touched by both of your stories very much. Um, and it really puts a personal perspective on, on conversations that we as surgeons have all the time with our patients and having to uh, try to explain the unexplainable um, to you. And, and thank you both for, for being so um, understanding of, of a very difficult circumstance. I, I would like to leave um, all Albertans out there that are watching this and hopefully um, there are some um, vaccine reluctant people that are that are watching. Um, it, it's important to understand that your decisions are impacting people. Um, uh, and it's it's really hard to understand that when you're trying to make a difficult decision, um, especially when there's so much misinformation out there. Um, I think it's really important to understand that um, that these lovely people are both in this situation because our hospitals are full of people who have not gotten vaccinated. And if everybody had gotten vaccinated um, when we when it was suggested um, and and we had kept um, looking after our population with this, the physical distancing measures that we set out with, I think that we well, I know we wouldn't be in this circumstance right now. So um, I think this is the most important takeaway from this um, conversation is please, please, please get vaccinated. It's it's far too late now to prevent the disaster that's unfolding in front of us, but at least it, it will take the steps towards some recovery so that we can we can all start to build towards a, a healthy healthcare system again. Thank you. I'd like to um, uh Thank Rachel and Eric. Uh, you both showed incredible vulnerability, which I think is something that um, Albertans need to see that you are, you are everyday people that are being affected by this and hundreds and, and thousands of other patients who are being affected by this, kids, adults. Um, and I, I just want to thank you for that because it's incredibly powerful. We as physicians, we get to see patients at their most vulnerable stages, but we don't get to share the stories for confidentiality and for many other reasons. And so I really thank you for sharing your stories. 
And I think the other thing that I'd like to leave Albertans with, and, and uh, this has been alluded to, is that we as healthcare providers do not need patients to self-triage themselves out. We really, really appreciate that the majority of Albertans have done the right things by continuing to mask, physically distance, distancing, getting vaccinated. Uh, you do not need to create capacity for us in the hospitals. That is not your job as Albertans, as patients. We are here to help you. So please, if you need the help, if you need to be seen by a physician, call 911, go to the emergency room. It is not your job to make sure the system stays safe inside the hospitals. If I can just talk as well, you know, I think, um, you know, the one the one concern I've always had with, with social media, for example, is that it's always been just numbers about how many are vaccinated, how many unvaccinated, how many in ICU, you know, how many we have in the hospital. But I, I think it I think those numbers, um, those numbers don't don't tell the story. Um, and I think for, for people like you, both Eric and Rachel, to come on here again, show an incredible amount of bravery. But it really highlights, I think, that these are not numbers. These are people. And they each have their stories. And we see them in ICU all the time. We see them in the hospital. And we have people like you guys who are waiting to have these things done that will improve your quality of life. And so we know these are, we know these are not numbers. These are stories. But I think having people like you sh like really show that is what really matters, that you know, we are all citizens of Alberta. And we all have, you know, have the right to, to a quality of life and to length of life. So I want to thank you. I get thinking about something that um, the photos that Dr. Schwartz was sharing earlier, and it actually got me thinking about the first time that watching my son code, um, I saw him flip over, his eyes closed, and then the alarms went off. And I had just enough presence of mind to know that I needed to get the blankety blank out of that room while it was flooded with several people all at once. And it was one physician who had enough to understand that he needed to talk me through the, the panic that was in my eyes, the just the unbelievable shaking, and just ask me a bunch of random questions and things like that. And I also know that that is an idea that people think, oh, you know, you're, you're a parent who's a superhero. And I heard that for so many years, but at the same time, people don't don't see that picture. They, 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 they just don't understand it. When my son had a stroke, they said, oh, or, so he actually did have a stroke. And they're like, no, I'm just here for the coffee. That's not how these things work. Real things happen in real time. And you want to have the reliability that you will have space to be cared for. Because when you are cared for, you are cared for in the most beautiful dance um, that um, anyone can ever have a pri privilege of experiencing. But these wonderful physicians also get tired of dancing. And we want to make sure that they have enough energy to make sure that they can dance with everybody. So um, again, I'm going to echo everybody else and just thank Rachel and Eric for, for sharing your stories and your vulnerability. It really does uh, have a big impact on us and, and hopefully uh, people listening at home. Um, so my, my takeaway um, is it's going to be disappointing for people because we thought we were past this. Um, but, um, you know, I think it really is time to hunker down. Uh, whether you're vaccinated or you're unvaccinated, you know, we are in such a crisis and, and hopefully we've imparted that on you today uh, that we really can't, uh, we can't afford a breakthrough infection. We can't afford, um, you know, individuals to become infected now because if you land up in the ICU in two or three weeks uh, or, you know, um, if your loved one ends up in the ICU, there is going to be a very real chance that, that we may not be able to look after you. We were, will absolutely do everything we can. Um, as Dr. Bakshi said, it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not. We're going to do our best to care for you. But the reality of it is that we are we're, um, running out of beds, and, and so it's, it's truly a, a disaster zone. Um, hunger down, you know, pick a Netflix movie, um, order in. You know, tip well uh, to your delivery driver. You know, we're going back to like, you know, March 2020 style lockdowns. Uh, whether it's mandated by the government or not, this is the right thing to do uh, to protect yourself and others. So, thank you. And I would uh, 
I like to say that this, for everyone, but especially our uh, healthcare workers, this has been a very, very long 19 months. Please be kind to one another. Show each other grace and compassion whenever you're able and um, just take care of each other. Thank you, everybody. All of our panelists, our doctors and experts, and our patients who were willing to show the faces and the stories of the individuals who are really affected by what has happened over the last week. We will be back next week. Randy will be away next week, and we will be joined by another member of the deaf community. We would like to express our deep gratitude for Randy and everyone at the Choice of Interpreters for their flexibility and assistance in helping us with our briefings over the last few weeks. Until next time, remember, COVID-19 is airborne. Wear the best available mask you have access to. Vaccinations really do save lives. So do doctors. So please seek help if you need it. Stay at home. Stay safe. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Alberta. 